Every year there are momentous stories in the news. Some tales of unbelievable achievement. Some stories inspire us. Others can make us concerned. And some news stories will make us angry. But it turns out we can't always believe everything we read and see in the news. My name's Tim White and I've been investigating. You are fake news. You are fake you are news. Fake news. news. Here in Ukraine, they reckon they know a thing or two about fake news. Since the revolution here in 2014, there have been many fake news stories. But is it a new phenomenon? Does it even matter? And what can or should be done to combat the global spread of fake news? I have hope that we're going to be able to get beyond the, the post-fact era. Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, we can put a tombstone on facts just yet. Um, there are definitely a lot of people out there who realize that fake news is uh, very dangerous, even to social cohesion, you know, at its basis. Um, and uh, they're doing something about it. For NATO, particularly in the Baltic region, the Russian propaganda has got really good um, in a way that would have been almost unimaginable back in the 1990s. The thing with a lie is if you have a lie about something that's happened in the public domain, you know, the shooting down of MH17, if it's happened in a public space, people share information about it online now. Disinformation is the deliberate spreading of a lie. And the problem is that these days, given the internet, given the satellite communications, you can tell a lie in Moscow and literally have it broadcast live in Auckland and Sydney and Vancouver and Beijing simultaneously. So disinformation can spread at the speed of the internet. In 2016, the US presidential election was memorable for many reasons. But one moment in particular caught the eye of millions. But this story was pure fantasy. Although it didn't stop thousands from believing it and many shared the story on social media. US-based journalist and filmmaker Simon Ostrovsky remembers it well. Well, I mean, I think the Pope story is a perfect example uh, of a uh, fake news story catching on like wildfire. Uh, because, you know, the Pope is a well-respected figure um, for uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people around the world. Um, and for him to have endorsed uh, Donald Trump uh, would have been sending a really important signal uh, to people who were maybe sitting on the fence uh, uh, about his candidacy. Um, and that story, you know, really had an impact. A lot of people saw it. And by the time it was debunked, I don't know whether more people saw the original story or more people saw the debunking. Of course, call it what you will, fake news or disinformation is nothing new. In the Second World War, Nazi Germany used William Joyce, nicknamed Lord Haw Haw, to try to demoralize Allied troops with propaganda radio broadcasts. Gregory Asmolov is a Russian-born journalist and researcher now based in London. So I think that the fake news is not a new phenomenon. Uh, we, could also, we could always see that information is uh, manipulated by different types of institutions in different types of countries, in, uh, in the West, in Russia, in other places in the world. But as we can see today, the new information technologies uh, provided new tools and new forms of manipulation. Uh, it's based on a different type of aspects of uh, information technologies, including so something that's called uh, algorithmic power, because today the information that we see, uh, the decision, uh, the decision what type of information we see are made not by uh, human agents very, uh, but often also by some algorithms. Uh, for instance, when we uh, follow our Facebook uh, news feed, uh, what we see there is actually based on different type of algorithmic uh, aspects of uh, uh, how the news feed is structured. And if you understand how this news feed uh, works, uh, you to some extent are able to manipulate uh, uh, what is more visible and what is less visible. I'm here in the heart of London's financial district. Many commuters will get their news from free newspapers such as this, and many more from online sites while on the trains or on the metro. The problem is that fake news is designed to distort reality, and many fear that could lead to instability. 
One thing's for sure, what financial institutions and the City of London doesn't like is instability. I think that it's a national security priority for all governments to worry about their information space, who is telling their population things, why is the pop which bits of the population are believing this and why. They need to think about this in terms of hostile foreign actors, also in terms of domestic sub subversion such as terrorism, and they need to counter it with a mixture of rebuttal and myth-busting, um, to some extent looking at the vehicles with which these um, hostile messages are being got across and seeing if there's anything from a legal or regulatory point of view that needs to be done and also with strong counter messaging. We did all this during the Cold War when we, it was a matter of existential survival so we've, yeah, we knew how to do it, we've just kind of forgotten and I think we need really to get, get back into gear in the way we were during the Cold War. Edward Lucas has written many books and articles about Russia and he's not alone in his views. One former NATO employee is adamant it's more than just harmless disinformation. Two nights of rioting in Tallinn, shops set fire, one guy stabbed to death and at least one journalist being assaulted. That's more than just disinformation. Fake news which spreads to thousands of accounts on social media and gets believed and gets regurgitated is more than disinformation. Fake stories that the annexation of Crimea was provoked because NATO was about to set up a naval base there, which then gets repeated in national parliaments by members of parliament, that's a problem. The disinformation is so pervasive and so long-lasting that it gets picked up and it gets recycled, and it gets repeated and it gets believed, and sometimes it gets believed by policymakers. In recent history, many became aware of fake news for the first time because of events in Ukraine and then Syria. Using modern innovations available to anyone, one British man was on the trail of the purveyors of false facts even before that, with remarkable success. So I really see it as um, not something that's intelligence, although there are applications to kind of the intelligence service. Really, uh, I mean, maybe you could call it citizen intelligence if you want. Um, I try not to put a label on it, I just try and encourage more people to do it. What we had uh, with Libya, which is where I started, is lots of kind of reports on social media about events from journalists, and they would drive past the town and say, oh, they're, you know, they're bombing this town or something like that. But I noticed a lot of these stories were being kind of not put together because they were off busy doing something else. So I started looking at this and thinking, well, you know, what if we track this stuff? Um, then someone, you know, I shared a video once and someone said, well, how do you know this is true? And I thought, actually, how do I know that? So I thought, well, there's a big mosque in it. I'll go to the town mentioned and look at the mosque and see if it's there. And, you know, lo and behold, it was there. It was the same shape and design. As war raged in Ukraine and Russia denied responsibility, Simon Ostrovsky created a remarkable video, Selfie Soldier. Now back in New York, he explained how the idea came about. So, I covered the Ukrainian conflict for uh, a couple of years and uh, one thing that I noticed was uh, how low the levels of trust in media were on both sides of the con on, on both sides of the conflict because uh, so much uh, so many fake stories and disinformation were being injected into the information space frankly by both sides uh, by uh, Russia and by Ukraine and you know in, in, in a conflict environment this is done to confuse your enemy and to boost morale in your supporters. Um, so it's not the same as, you know, with an election here in the United States. It's a bit of a different situation. But the net effect is the same, uh, in that uh, trust uh, in any information that people get is very low. And realizing um, that it was going to be very, very difficult to convince uh, anybody of anything, um, I tried to devise a way of showing that I had done the verification myself to try to find out if, a, uh, if Russia had used its military in Ukraine. At the time, Russia was denying um, that any of its forces were involved and that it was a party to the conflict at all. Anybody who had been covering the war realized that that was just simply untrue, but the problem was uh, getting our viewers to understand that. 
What I did was I traced the social media posts of a Russian soldier who'd been photographing himself in Ukraine. If I just posted those uh, photographs on our news website and said, look, it's a Russian soldier in Ukraine, um, job done, case closed, people could have very easily said, um, well, you just took a picture of a Russian soldier from a, another conflict and wrote your own caption on it, why should we believe you? Um, so I went out to the places where the soldier actually took the pictures and took pictures of myself in the same poses as he was on the very locations that he took them in order to establish that I had verified where those photographs came from. And then I tracked that soldier down and I found him to show that he was indeed a real soldier in the Russian military. Also in Ukraine in early 2014, a group of academics and journalists fed up with Russian propaganda came up with a new idea. Я сиділа на роботі, розшифровувала інтерв'ю на іншій роботі, я працюю в Ньюзрумі, і заглядала в групу на Фейсбуці, в якій йшло обговорення того, що робити з російською пропагандою, з тією кількістю фейків, яка зараз виникла. І я просто написала два рядки, що давайте зробимо сайт, в якому будемо збирати неправдиві новини про Україну і спростовувати їх. Всі підхопили цю ідею. Наша аудиторія дуже схвально сприйняла це. Тобто ми просто були вражені реакцією насправді, тому що вже через дві години ми написали невеличку статей, статтю на, в інтернеті про те, що е, створений такий проект, який спростовує неправдиву інформацію про події в Україні, зокрема в Криму. І е, вже за дві години було 13 тисяч репостів цієї новин, новинки. Тобто ми фактично на наступного дня ми вже були популярні. Просто от, е, багато людей нам писали, пропонували допомогу, присилали фейки. Не було проблеми шукати фейкові новини, щоб їх спростовувати. Їх просто присилали, а дехто навіть вже спростовував і присилав готові спростування. Ми просто, е, люди дуже дякували нам за те, що ми є за те, що ми це робимо. Спочатку за це взялися близько 80 людей, волонтерів, всі хотіли брати участь. Потім виявилося, що у всіх є робота, що всі зайняті, всім треба заробляти гроші. Людей ставало все менше, менше і менше. Ну, були моменти, коли ми збиралися просто і говорили, що чи буде існувати проект, чи ні. І звичайно, що доклада, доклали всіх зусиль для того, щоб він існував. Founders of the Stop Fake site soon realized a more sinister side to proceedings. So the very first story I wrote for the Stop Fake website was about uh, Ukrainian refugees in Russia. There were a lot of reports in Russian media and uh, it was reports about thousands of Ukrainian refugees in Russia. And uh, I called to Federal Migration Service of Russia and they told me we had just five phone calls from people from Ukraine. So we don't understand where this inc information came from. And so there is no Ukrainian refugees in Russia, the answer is. And, uh, but that lady I called, she told me, but we have received the, f the order from Moscow to prepare hundreds of places for refugees. But there were no refugees. It was two months before all the events in the east of Ukraine uh, began. So suddenly I realized that having information uh, about messages they send through their media, you can kind of predict what's going on. And I have a lot of such kind of examples when uh, following uh, and paying attention to messages Russian media and Russian propaganda sends, you can predict the future. So far we've heard a lot about the history and some of the dangers of fake news. But what's been done to tackle the problem? Well, quite a lot actually. Facebook, Twitter and a host of top international broadcasters now support First Draft, an organization specifically set up in response to this growing menace. We had 30 partners and uh, news organisations join in September when we first launched the Partner Network and we've got uh, a little over 80 now in terms of organisations who want to work together and find some solutions to this and see how we can verify news and how we can work together to find solutions to these problems that are challenging journalism and media and social media at the moment. And the general public is using its eagle eyes too. 
some of the work we've done with Bellingcat, we've used crowdsourcing, for example, to analyze large amounts of information. When the Russian Ministry of Defense um, started publishing videos of its bombing of Syria, um, they had you know, gun camera videos showing the bombs hitting their targets, and they were describing them as being ISIS targets. So um, we basically crowdsourced these locations. We asked people who were kind of following Bellingcat's work to find um, these locations on Google Earth. And you're basically, you know, doing spot the difference. You find the satellite image on Google Earth and you look at the, you know, video and you can see they're the same. What we discovered there is the Russian Ministry of Defense's own videos showed that they were not bombing Islamic State targets. Donald Trump used the term fake news to strike back against the media, some of whom had reported the existence of a dossier which alleged that Moscow had compromising material on the now president. That report is believed to have been written by Christopher Steele, a former British spy who used to work here at the home of the British Intelligence Service. CNN reported that a dossier, a, a two-page summary, sorry, of a, a specific intelligence dossier had been shown to Obama and to Trump. BuzzFeed then published the dossier in full. Now, that to a degree is showing the working of the, the, you know, the halls of power in Washington because decisions were being made and that, that dossier had been circulated for months. Trump shouting fake news um, just at a press conference isn't helpful and ultimately undermines him to a large degree as well. Um, it is, it, you know, just shouting fake news seems desperate to, to a certain degree, but really, if people are, you know, news organizations, whether that's CNN or BuzzFeed or anyone else, can, can show why they're doing this in the first place and show the steps that they've taken, hopefully that will help to, to dispel accusations like that. And I thought that the dossier on Mr. Trump was a good example of raw intelligence stuff that had been collected in Russia quite um, ably from quite interesting range of sources, but it hadn't been checked because whereas a state intelligence agency can cross-check what its human sources say with other human sources and also with in, in electronic intercepts and what other intelligence agencies are saying, a private intelligence company basically has to go on the basis of what it's been able to collect itself and that means that the quality of intelligence is much less. It doesn't mean that it is all wrong, but at least some of it is going to be wrong. So fake news can be a problem on both sides of the Atlantic. It's a hotly debated topic and Western governments appear to be catching up belatedly. I think what you've seen is the, the, the methods of disinformation have remained pretty constant and, and I think of them as the four Ds, dismiss, distort, distract and dismay. So something that I have seen a lot with um, particularly Russian government communications but also I must say with, with other disinformation actors in other areas. Um, if you criticize their action or if you say that something they've done is wrong, the first thing that will happen is they will dismiss you. They will say, well, you, you shouldn't even listen to this guy because he used to work at NATO or because he's a Russophobe or because he hates Putin or because he's corrupt or he's a Nazi or whatever. They will, they will just dismiss you. I have what I call the four P's of fake news. And they're basically the reasons it's created, disseminated, uh, and why people share it. So. I say there's the propaganda reasons, there's political reasons, there's reasons of passion, and the reasons for profit. There was one story which provoked so much anger and was easily debunked, alleging a child had been crucified by Ukrainian nationalists. Many believe this story helped Russia sign up volunteers for the war in Ukraine. I also could see uh, some kind of emotional wave of anger uh, from uh, the side of people who believe in this story and some uh, great frustration uh, from people who question this story. So again, you could see that uh, the online follow-up was full of emotions, anger, engagement. And this is the major problem uh, about this type of fake news. It's not only the information which is uh, probably fake, but the way it changed the attitude of people and the way they feel about the conflict and the, the way they communicate to other people and the way uh, this type of uh, fake news actually destroy the social ties between people that were connected before. So this type of polarization which is caused or supported by fake news, I think it's one of the major challenges that we need to face. 
I think that uh, people have been uh, untrustful of the news in Russia for a very long time, and, and that comes with the Soviet legacy. What's been surprising to me uh, has been that uh, people have been very uh, happy and eager to gobble up, you know, this new uh, phenomenon of uh, Russian fake news on steroids, because uh, if at least uh, in the early Putin years they tried to stick to the facts and spin it uh, in a way that was helpful to the government, Right now, we've got a situation where journalists are literally uh, making stories up and, and falsifying events, uh, portraying them um, as if they happen when they never did happen. And, you know, that's a, that's a very uh, big shift from what we've had before. We used to argue about, you know, whether news can be unbiased and whether people um, ever don't have an agenda. Uh, today, I think it's shifted way beyond, you know, talking about whether stories have an agenda. Today, it's whether stories actually took place at all. It seems like almost everything in our ever-changing world that the techniques used for creating and disseminating propaganda are constantly evolving. I think that the, 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 the new thing is you have a very powerful country, Russia, which has real capabilities in hacking, um, is hacking information and leaking it. That's number one, that they are able to use the anonymity of the internet to create um, websites that look like news sites but that aren't. They're able to come up with stories that are utterly untrue, like the Lisa case in Germany, and spread these around using the speed and ubiquity of the internet to have a political effect. All these things are quite new compared with the old Soviet model of disinformation, which was much more ponderous and much easier to track. What has changed is the, the aggression and the blatancy of, of the disinformation. There's much more of it. It's much more far out, and it goes right up to the top. You know, the classic example would be President Putin was asked in a press conference in early March 2014, who are those people in Crimea, who have now taken over the government buildings, these famous little green men with military uniforms but no insignia. And Putin said, those are local self-defense forces. And later on he said, there are no Russian forces in Ukraine. A year later he said, well yes, that was a Russian special forces operation and I ordered it and I will tell you all about the meeting where I ordered it and where I said that this had to happen. So you have the president of one of the UN Security Council permanent members blatantly lying in a press conference you know, for an understandable strategic and tactical reason. He wanted to make sure that the operation went ahead. But actually to have a world leader lying like that on camera is relatively rare. And, and to, to, to break, you know, there, there are many ways of evading the truth. Many, many leaders do them. Again, this is not a purely Russian thing. But to do a flat out lie is quite striking. And some organizations and news outlets have struggled to dodge propaganda. The question around that would be how, who is saying what is true and what is not and how, again, those conclusions are reached. Um, and that's something which Facebook, I think, in particular, has been struggling with in not wanting to be known as a, as a media company because they don't want to be those arbiters of truth. Um, and that's why they're bringing in a number of third parties to do that. Ideally, yes. It, well, ideally, it would only be true information you know, that is being circulated. Um, but again, the question that, that the, the follow-on question is that's who decides what's true and what is not. Um, which is why I think in all of these processes, whether it's social networks, whether it's news organizations, showing the working, being open about how specific conclusions are reached and allowing people to follow that process makes things much less opaque. You know, that's, that's one of the big kickbacks which the last year uh, has, has, has shown us from, from the, the rise of populism, as many have called it, is because many see the media and news organizations as part of this global elite who are, are covering things up and pushing a set of interests. And by opening up the reporting process, and how, whether that's on, on, on Facebook or whether that's uh, news organizations into how conclusions are reached, can help to make it more transparent and can help to rebuild trust then. One of the most tragic tales with allegations of alternative facts and fake news surrounds the downing of Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 in eastern Ukraine in July 2014, with the loss of almost 300 lives. Russia strongly denies any responsibility, 
But those intent on exposing fake news point to what they say is one of their greatest successes. Um, I think from a purely propagandist uh, aspect was the case of MH17 because what you saw coming from the Russian Ministry of Defense in their July 21st press conference on, you know, a few days after MH17 was shot down are all provable lies. And really when you think about it, you know, nearly 300 people had died and the first reaction from Russia was to present fakes, lie about their evidence, um, and it, they were completely shameless about it. And com to compound that, two years later, they said they had lost their radar data and all of a sudden they find it again. But this time the radar data, which had previously shown a Ukrainian jet near MH17, didn't show anything near MH17. So their own data contradicted their own press conference. So, you know, when you have that level of just barefaced lying, I mean, that is really, you know, it's, it's hard to beat that. So we've seen some of the devastating effects that fake news can have, particularly in war zones. Here in Ukraine, where nearly 10,000 people have died in the ongoing conflict, they're still searching for solutions.